I bid you welcome as we continue with the very last segment in the life of the soul. Indeed, and how is one to consider the last segment of a soul as if indeed that were possible? And yet we explore here a cycle. Perhaps, yes, that better put, the last in the great cycle of the soul as it expresses itself through one journey, one lifetime. Here perhaps a pause as we recall the timelessness of a soul, its eternal nature, unmeasured and untethered by time, by the passage of time, noticing its life, its full expression in a human body, noticing how the body and mind and spirit watch the passage of time, the ticking of the clock, the movement of the pages of a calendar from one year to the next. And to the soul, all of this is folly, for it can never measure itself in a day or a lifetime. And yet the soul understands the process. It understands the process by which it has immersed itself into a human life and into all of the beliefs associated with that human life, including that one is bound by time, that a body as a vehicle, well, it lasts a certain number of years, after which time it will expire. Yes, it can be renewed, its contract can be extended, oh, but for how long? But you see, matters not, for by that time the soul also prepares to move to another journey, to another place when it's dimension. Yet again I say to you, the soul does not see the beginning or the midpoint or the end of a life. It sees chapters, it sees segments, journeys, explorations, discoveries, adventures. And so it does not hurry to complete a purpose, as perhaps you have heard at other times. A soul does not hurry, for to hurry would in fact involve the passage of time. The soul then encourages acceleration, which is unique in its experience. To accelerate then is to explore in a deeper sense. It is to call upon more aspects. It is to reach further and beyond what time offers. So here a distinction then. We have said to the soul, time does not exist and it does not hurry and yet it does accelerate. To accelerate means to further purpose. It means to enliven. It means to excite. It means to quicken, not in terms of a pace by which one would walk, but to quicken the soul's ability to delve, to call forth. It enriches, yes, acceleration then is enrichment to the soul. And perhaps then that is the best orientation as we enter this last segment in the exploration of the life of the soul. Now it is time for enrichment. Now, does everyone whom you meet, in their 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s, or even the centenarians, do you see them excited about life? Do they seem content and joyful? Well, perhaps small is the number that you would say to this. And again, it is the soul at this point that is excited. For the soul has managed to, yes, gather the attention, capture the attention of the being, of the body, of the spirit, of the purpose. It is not reined in. It is not by boundaries. But because it has excited the cells, the molecules, the atoms to such a degree that the body in some ways rejuvenates itself as well. Now, are all 
bodies able to rejuvenate themselves? No, not all. To some degree it depends upon the heredity of the body, and there are some bodies that, well put, well used, are not as able to regenerate from the cellular structure. There are some bodies that have larger, stronger strains of atoms, depending upon their original construction, their original forming, coming together. And these stronger, just as you have noted, there are those of stronger genetic structure, these are able to regenerate the cells, restart them to a greater degree than others, and so able to some degree to rejuvenate the body as well. Can intention, the intention of the being, make up for the disadvantage of a physical structure? Yes, to some degree, a very strong intention gathered by observing the physical and non-physical properties of life. One cannot bypass or completely avoid, but one can instill within the body such a great trust, such a great communion and understanding of life itself that the cells literally obey, obeisance. The soul then is in the command of the body, mind and spirit. Again, this is not possible, it is not automatic in all beings. And here we must say that the distinction comes from those that would perhaps be considered old souls. How can you tell? an old soul from a new one. Well, by some standards, I will say to you that not many young, young souls will last in their bodies high into the 70s and 80s and 90s and beyond. For one must have control of the body. By then, one must have command of one's faculties. And to the younger souls, just as those that might be younger at piloting vehicles, there is a recklessness about it. There is a recklessness that simply believes that the body, which is no more than a physical vehicle after all, can simply last and last and last and last. Or there is a disregard for whether it will last or not. For the younger soul is interested in as many, as many adventures as soon as possible, and so it pays little mind to managing a body to its long-lasting second and third births or abilities to rejuvenate or to call upon. So that is one of the simplest ways to tell. Does it mean that every senior citizen you come across is also an old soul? No, not necessarily. So indeed there are more subtleties here. An old soul can be seen, however. An older soul, I will tell you, is more patient, though not necessarily more kind, for at times patience also has a kind of intolerance associated with it as well. An older soul is one that, yes, does not judge. An older soul will say, do as you wish. It will come out just fine in the end. Do as you wish. If it is not this time, it will be next time. Do what you like. You will be guided. Do what you think. The minefield of the mind is worth exploring. Do what you feel. Your heart will not belie nor betray you. Do what you must. Follow the organized thought. Follow so until you can lead. So you see, one can indeed find the older souls. And when you do, well, tis worth tipping your hat to them. Tis worth giving them a handshake, a small bow, a gratitude. For one day they will leave behind that vehicle, and I assure you, they will leave it behind much as they have found it, vacant but whole something to aspire to. In this next phase of life, the soul's last phase with regards to the present incarnation, the soul begins to revive almost everything, 
it begins to retrieve older thoughts that it considered but had never quite made a decision on. Here you will find some individuals who become very, very opinionated. They will tell you just what they think about almost anything, whether it is your business or interest or not. Is it simply because they have become older, busy bodies? No, not necessarily. For you see, now the soul has made it a point to retrieve all those things and thoughts that had been left undone. If longer ago the soul did not have an opinion because it wished to gather more experience, now it does. Now it comes full circle. Now it sees its own reflection. Now, in order to see your own reflection, I assure you, you must be willing to see your own shadow as well. So here you have as well, then, the soul who has come and gone and come again. The soul who has seen the shadow and the light and found the uniqueness in each one, found, as matter of fact, that they are both brother and sister, that they are cousins, both sharing the same throne, that they are equal in measure. Here the soul does not fight, neither the light nor the dark. Here you find that the soul does not immediately spend its life doing good deeds, and yet it finds that there is goodness, and it wishes to participate in that. Goodness and good deeds are not necessarily the same. Out of the goodness of a soul, then, there is the philanthropic adventure, the desire to see good acts performed in the world. That is not the same as a charitable function or a charitable donation. A soul's philanthropic effect is simply comes from the desire to see good at work in the world, to see goodness prevail, which is not the same as to do battle with difficulty or poverty or war. The desire to see goodness expressed in the world is the philanthropic view of the soul. And when there is a kinship between the soul and the body, mind, and spirit of the lifetime, yes, good deeds are known to come from that. Ideas that are of benefit to the young and to the old. So here is not the same as to fight for a cause, you see. Here is not the warrior. Oh, no. Here is the peacemaker. Here is the one that walks already between the shadows of light, or between life and death, or what it will be. For here you find those that have less and less fear of death, for instance. By now the soul has infused within the being the possibilities that life is life and that all of life is continual. So there is no fading into the background, and rarely is there a hurry, as we said earlier, of what must be done before it is too late. No, here you have then a carefully crafted path. Without a hurry there is a stride, however. Perhaps there is an urgency to a matter, if it matters to those upon this plane. So do not mistake the urgency of a matter or the urgency of a project with the soul in a hurry to do something or to accomplish something, for these two are a bit unique. The soul now continues its adventure, seeking and moving and discovering and collaborating with others. Here you find those that have to share with others then a like mind, a like journey, a like truth. It is a time to collaborate. And, of course, you will find those that struggle against this as well. And here again you will find, then, the difference between a younger soul and an older or a more mature soul. Careful as you make the distinction that you do not see an older, a senior human being is not the same as to say that you see a senior soul, for they are much different. The soul that is in communion with the human aspect, with the mind and with the heart, here there is a great deal to be discovered. The humanitarian work begins then. 
What is humanitarian work? Well, it is to further certain tasks, certain thoughts or creativities that were begun longer ago or earlier in the life or perhaps even in a life before this one. A humanitarian work, then, is a deed in favor of the present or future of humanity, and perhaps it is even to set a record aright or to set a truth aright. Here you may even find one that discovers that in what is the remainder of this life it wishes to correct a historical perspective. Perhaps it would wish to say, in this life, you know, I was this being or that being, and what is written here or told about me or that life, that is incorrect. And while the soul cannot directly communicate to the human being that it wishes to change history, that is what it is doing. It begins to affect history by affecting the truth. How do you change history? Can you simply go back to this time or that time and change history? No, not necessarily, though indeed it has been done. You see, when you go back in time to change history, you change everything, including the going back. And so the very being that is in the process of going back, that going is changing and changing and changing and changing. So you cannot be the being that goes back to the changed thing without having been changed in the process. The better way to change history or to affect the future is to do so from the present moment. From the present moment, one affects or begins a new and distinct thought, one of a higher vibration, one that contains more truth, one that excites the atoms in that time more than the previous energy or truth did. Expanding upon that truth, then, all things begin to change, either to unravel in a certain way so that they can take a new course, a new direction, or without the integrity to uphold a truth. If a truth is no longer true, it will not be able to stand upon its own merit. And so anything or any one that comes up against that less than meritous thought or experience or being will in some way be compelled to act upon it, to change it, to move away from it, or in some way to exert energy upon it. And so that thing and the thoughts associated with that thing become changed. And so here I tell you, that there are many that will come from other lives to this one. And if, if, a little bit like you would think about a meal, if you finish your main course, you can have dessert. Well, if you have completed your life's work, your purpose, you are then, yes, free to exert influence, to exert force upon the present moment in such a way as to correct another time or place or purpose, or truth, or lifetime. There are those, then, that you will find that set about that course, set aside, discerning how to change, how to restore a good name, how to give credit to one who may have created or been the inventor of something and did not get credit for that in that lifetime. And so truths are revisited in one way or another. And that is why it matters not, again, to the soul what credit is given for its accomplishments. The human may care to be noticed for what it has designed or engraved upon life. But the soul is not so interested in being given credit or accolades in a certain life for having created or invented something new. It knows, again, because it does not measure itself based upon time, that all that it does, in good measure, is accepted, is notable, is useful, is practical, is loving, and, in its own time and place, 
will come to its own full and complete accord. The benefit of the soul is that it sees far into the future, far into the past, if necessary, and whether or not it conveys this to the human aspect, it is seen none the less. You see many tomorrows, you see many horizons, but you do not see them all. You cannot yet imagine how the rest of this life will go, and you cannot imagine what will be in the next life, but the soul can. The soul already begins to create, to research, to call upon, to prepare a next life, each one then being purposeful and plentiful and full. Once the purpose of one life is complete, the next life is already being planned. So here I tell you that for those that say, Oh, this is my last lifetime upon the earth, don't you know? Well, not necessarily. It is the last lifetime in a series that is being considered. It is the last lifetime in how one goes about the structure so that the next time round there will be a lighter structure. There will be less choice, less purpose, in the human standpoint, and much more to the divine aspects. So the soul begins to divine and decide what will come in future lifetimes in that way. And so plans, motions. All the while, the body itself, even if it is being rejuvenated, well, the body still ages, you know. The body has seen many, many seasons, and so the body prepares in its own way to return to the earth or to the materials of the earth. The body does not struggle against this. The parts that struggle are the mind. The mind is the finite aspect of soul, spirit, body, lifetime. Here there is the one part that is finite, and it is the human mind. Now, you are imbued with an infinite mind, mind of creator, universal mind, divinity mind, or what you will term it. And yet, the aspect of you that manages the human life and the human bond, it is a human mind. It is the mind-brain, gray matter combination that orchestrates and coordinates everything associated with this life. This mind communicates not only with the greater mind, but also with soul, in order to have brought about all of the activities that are important and associated with the purpose, as the soul has orchestrated it. However, it is a little bit like what you might consider a part-time job or a contract job, understanding that it will come to an end at some point at some time, and the timeless aspects of the soul will, of course, continue forward. For the most part, there is peace in this, but not completely. Now, in a lifetime, is every purpose achieved? Yes, the soul achieves its purpose. Why then do some individuals believe that they did not live well or live purposefully or get what they wanted in life or find the joy or happiness or like that? Why the disparate thoughts in this case? Well, the answer being that while the soul was resourceful in all of its capacities to know and to see and undertake a purpose. The mind could only participate in this to the degree that it was conscious in the process, just like you can only participate in your day to the degree that you are awake in the day. If you are asleep during the day, much of your day will pass you by. It will go unnoticed by you even if you were alive and breathing during the time. So here you find a time then when there is the lamenting in some ways. Here you will find not the soul, but the limited mind of the being 
that begins its sad lament. I did not live as I wished to live. I did not have children nor grandchildren. I did not sail round the world as I had promised myself I would. I did not climb the tallest peak nor find my way to the deepest oceans. I did not have the love of my life nor recover my health completely. I did not have the wealth that I have sought. I did not work at the kind of career that I had originally called for myself. I do not have this relationship nor that nor the respect that I deserve at this time. Here I tell you that when you find those who clamor for a respect that they do not receive, it is because they have not lived according to their own soul's code, and in some ways they have forfeit something of value. At this late juncture, just as a child would set about its whining and its crying, the older individual would set aside time to demand from others what it did not get, what it did not give to others. And here you will find those crotchety in their own ways, alone and lonely in their thoughts, rambling on about how it is and who listens and who does not listen, and like that. Again, another example you may note, for you will see that the older souls rarely set about this way. It is the younger souls who lament, first in the younger ages, then again in the middle, and then to the last even, lamenting how it is and why it was and why it did not work, and how only the unworthy unjust take the place of the righteous. So be it. Note those that are around you. And when you see ones in this capacity, you may simply say to yourself, Now there goes a younger soul still. Ah, and this one too will grow and mature and discover, and I will see that one again. Surely I have been that one, so surely I will meet that one along the hero's path yet again. To the older soul, to the more mature soul, then, there comes a sweetness. Matters not even if the body begins to slowly, or even in a greater pace, accelerate its deterioration a little bit more. The older soul will say, Ah, and life is sweet. Ah, and I have lived well, and how short is life. And oh, what I would like to do still. Whether I do or not is irrelevant, but I tell you I would still like to do this, to know this, to go here or there. I would like to impart wisdom or to share joys. I would like yet to do the silliest and smallest of things. I would like to taste what life still has to offer. Again, notable the differences between the younger souls and the older souls. The younger souls will say, Ah, if I had it to do over again, I would do this and I would do that, and I would never do that, nor take advantage of this or like that. The older, more mature soul will say, Hmm, perhaps I would have changed a thing or two, or perhaps yet, upon second consideration, I might have left it all the same, just as it was. For it has been a journey after all, and in the undertaking of that, have I not learned, have I not grown, have I not shared, have I not savoured from life itself? And so there is the savouring aspect of life now, and the notable differences, perhaps now, more than at any other time, you begin to see the soul reflected through the human body. The soul begins to reveal itself, because now there is no more fear that the soul will get caught up into the gravitational field of the earth, for instance. No, the soul knows that now, its path is already committed. Its fate is sealed, if you like, but it does not see it that way. It simply sees that there is a little more time still. Now it sees time as something playful, something that it can toy with. It can stay or go. It can infuse its body with a little bit more energy or not. It can play with time, stretch it, pull it, tug upon it, 
condense it, extract one hour of a day that is unique and special, nap through the entire day if it chooses to, not missing anything, knowing that all things are complete. As the body, then, begins to, well, atrophy a small amount or deteriorate a small amount, here you will see that some do so in a sweet sense, in a childlike, innocent sense, or perhaps in ways that are more abrupt. Now, here is a time in which the soul is truly in charge, truly notable in its ability to begin to draw to it unique experiences that one would marvel at, and how did this one come about such a unique feat at that age, you would hear it say. Or perhaps it will simply say, Ah, and it has been an adventure, and like a fine wine we have poured out all of the contents and drunk to the merry, and then it is time to withdraw. To the older, more mature soul you will see that. You will begin to see a simple desire to withdraw from those things of life, less desire for the material, less desire even for unique and special moments that are new and original. And it is not because life altogether becomes boring. No, not that. Instead, it is that life simply completes itself. Every day and every hour feel rather complete, with little doubt upon the matter. The day itself completes, and the soul begins to retreat from the body, not by removing its energy but by allowing the body to be what it is naturally, with less and less direction. The older, more mature soul, then, allows the wisdom of the body to take the lead, rather than soul's purpose, rather than life's journey. It allows the body itself to lead, in what way and what direction it will. Now there are interesting anomalies that come with this. For a soul, you see, trusts not only the mind and the spirit, but the elemental body as well. The soul now trusts that the body will know in its own wisdom, in its own earthly intelligence, what to do and how to do it. The soul is less interested in the body at this point then. Still, yes, somewhat managing its resources to some degree, but the soul is now already interested in planning and plotting its next adventure, which is not to say that it is disrespectful for the body or its mechanisms. It is not to say that the soul does not wish to keep for its own concern and consideration the body at a well-kept pace but it does begin to withdraw with care, with compassion, allowing the body's elemental wisdom, the earthly intelligence, to begin to lead. Now remember, the body does not belong to the soul. It belongs, in fact, to the earth. The body, in fact, belongs to Gaia. The body is made of earth elements, it was created here upon the earth. It was accelerated here, enlivened here, by spirit, by soul. But the body itself, its waters, its clay, its structure, the bone, mineral, water, the body belongs to me. The soul then, with great care and respect, begins to set about tidying that house as best as possible. Here we speak of the highest scenario. Here we speak then of the mature soul entrusting the body to its own walk. Slowly then, or at times very quickly, in an accelerated motion, creating its own time and place, not for its demise, but for its correct exit at a time and purpose and choosing of its own. 
Now, to the less conscious or to the less evolved souls, this is when you see a time of great difficulty. This is when you see dis-ease or discomfort. Here you see the older beings that have then fallen, perhaps hurting their hip or another organ then. What is to be made of this? It is not then worthwhile, as you might know, to transplant entire organs if the rest of the body cannot also be rejuvenated to work in sync with that organ. The older souls know this, understand this, but the younger ones do not. So the younger souls then become in more difficult states, hurting themselves one day after the next, creating one malady after another, one discomfort, illness or dis-ease, and, for the most part, bringing others into that experience as well. Help me, pull me, fix me, take me, and like that. Again, these are experiences associated with a younger soul. This is not to say that there is judgment for one or the other, for there is always purpose in the discovery of this, and there is much to be discovered in the process, yes. The older soul will then set about, then, its final checks, if you like, discovering and choosing for itself its own completions, saying its goodbyes, or beginning to withdraw in just the way that it does, and content to do so. The soul's journey, then, the soul's participation in life begins to find a gradual, complete movement of all that is light. There are changes to be noted in the body. There are changes to be noted in the eyes, the windows to the soul, yes? Many times the eyes become lighter in color, not simply clouded over with less than an ability to see clearly. No, the eyes themselves take on a lighter quality about them. More light enters the structure and they find themselves lighter in being as well. This is the case with many older, more mature bodies and more mature souls as well. The bodies become less in density. They begin to release less weight. They begin to release thoughts. They begin to release dense weighted thoughts so that they are more uplifted in the process as well. Sometimes this process of releasing density calls upon the body to sleep more in the process. So you will see that older individuals require a little bit more sleep or more naps. It is not that they are tired, I assure you. It is in some ways that the soul already wishes to be elsewhere, and so it prepares and cares for the body a great deal. It uses that body to dream, spell its next life, to begin to weave already the ideas of a next life. And yes, it gives glimpses and purpose to this life as well. In other words, the completion of this life affords at times the ability to see the next life and even to participate in it to a same degree. You see, it is not that the soul will choose the same body or the same being or the same life, but it is a gift. And why not? And why not? It is a gift that the soul says, look, look, this is the direction that we are moving in. Look, this is what I am creating. Would you like to see the future? Would you like to see an adventure? And so there are dreams. Older individuals, as you know, have great and grand dreams. They could not even begin to describe them, for their reality comes from a different place in which the soul has given them a gift, a glimpse to see and to do. Do all Individuals have this ability? No. The soul must be in deep communion. There must be a sufficient union between soul and being or body for the most part during the life and especially during this phase. 
otherwise it would only seem to be a dream to the older human being and a dream that is not remembered at that. Only when there is a deep and abiding respect and communion in all of the areas of body, mind, spirit, then there is the acceleration in which the soul can infuse a great light and a great understanding for the beingness and for the body. Well then, somewhat we return to our beginning point. Does the soul, can the soul die? No, it cannot. A soul is an eternal nature. It is a thingless thing. It is a thought that has never existed. It is experience that it has created. It is that which is and is not. And because it is neither is nor is not, it is. A little bit of a paradox, yet you will see that you can reconcile it with a little bit of attention upon that. So the soul knows that it cannot terminate itself, and yet knows as well that it has used the body, the vehicle, to its highest capacity. The most mature of the souls, then, will find the perfect time and place and coordinated effort by which to gently put down the body, which knows as well in its own elemental way that it has completed its journey. In this case, the mind does not struggle. It does not struggle to power or to overpower. Here you have individuals, then, with just enough time to say a fond goodbye to loved ones or to friends or those that wish once more to take themselves to a certain place that was endearing to them at some point in their life. Here you have a well-organized, a well-crafted exit. And while that is not always the case, it is certainly plentiful enough. The young soul is not always able to orchestrate so much. It has not yet learned. For instance, imagine a young cook struggling in the kitchen to make in time all things for a well-coordinated and set meal. Well, the young soul is a little bit like that. It is very difficult for it to coordinate all of the exit points, the strategies, the completions, to manage body, mind, spirit, and relation. And so here you find haphazard moments in which it could not coordinate all and found an exit in one way or another, but perhaps at an unexpected moment, you see, one that did not seem planned, one that seemed just a little bit too soon, or not the way anyone imagined it would go. So be it, a small acknowledgement then. Now, what does the soul do? Once it prepares or has already left the body, does it simply abandon it, saying, thank you very much, and I'm off to the next experience? Well, in some ways, yes, because once the purpose of that life has been completed, there is less and less interest of the life of the soul in the body that it has bonded with. However, it is also a respectful moment, and so the soul then will make accommodations if not for the body or for that being, at times it will make accommodations and adjustments for other beings associated with that life, and this can be called the gift of spirit. So imagine then, for instance, that there are those that would receive an inheritance that they had not planned on. In some ways, it is not simply the life of the being or the leftover properties, it is the soul that choosing to make a difference until the moment or from beyond the moment if you like has orchestrated crafted carefully what could be of benefit to others of that life imagine a younger body where the soul will say i have a donor in mind for this organ or that and make certain that that happens that is also a crafting by the soul's perspective 
a martyr, what you would term a martyr, that is also crafted by the soul. You see, in all of these ways, it is the soul reaching into and through and beyond life in its simplest sense in order to bring about or to effect a higher order or a higher change. So even just before or just after or during, as we have seen throughout this series, the soul's purpose plays a very large part. It has never begun and so it never ends. And so even from beyond the beyond, beyond the grave, if you would use that terminology, the soul is still active because the soul exists in the present moment. And if there is a way that it can active or activate a presence in the life of what is taking place, it is within the soul's perspective to do so. It simply does. It does not think about it in a sense of the mind. Hmm, would that be a good idea or not? Would that complicate things or muck things up or make them better? The soul does not contemplate or think about something in a way that the mind does. The soul is and does, makes active and then withdraws. In its own way, then, the soul continues even a bit more, perhaps bringing messages to some who remain on this side of the veil after the soul has already transitioned. There are messages, there are moments, there are truths, there are discoveries. There is a way in which the soul can impulse the lives of others that it has left behind, if it can. How? And when does one choose this? Well, there needs to be a mark. There needs to be a moment, a momentary marker that was set some place during the lifetime, a little bit like what you would call a bookmark. One would set a bookmark in some chapter of life, in a page, in an hour, in a day of life. Put a marker there and say, I will return here. There is work to be done here. There is a gift to be given there is something that is worthwhile making active here. In all of this way, then, the soul makes its way to that marker as if it were a beacon that has called it, and indeed it must be that strong, otherwise the soul's calling would not simply bring it back into the life. And so the soul will set upon making the changes bringing the benefits or the gifts, the blessings to others. For it is always within the soul's perspective to bring growth, companionship, to add to the lives of others, for it will only add to oneself. Not because doing good, a good deed, is better or necessary, simply because it is what a soul is. A soul does based upon what a soul is. Not all soul structures reach back into a life. It is more the aspects of the older souls again. But I tell you here that it is possible and that it is likely for some, in fact, that it will do so. And so, a life completed and the soul, the life of the soul, continues. And now then, and what? A life is complete, and the soul says, Oh, thank you, that was a lovely life. Thank you very much, I enjoyed it oh so very much. See you again? Not exactly. For souls come together in great conclaves, as you might imagine. If perhaps you can imagine the great gathering of angels, an angelic conference. Well, at times there are conclaves associated with souls as well were great groups of entity, beings, souls, great light, great imaginings, great truths, great love, great compassion is pulled together. Almost inevitably comes the unmistakable love and compassion, the magnetic of the souls. And so in this great outpouring, the life of the soul is extended even just a little bit longer in a marriage of heaven, if you like, in which all souls are brought together. Great mysteries appear, and great magic appears 
upon the earth. And in moments such as these, great light gathers and great change, great momentous change and evolution at times takes place upon the earth. The earth is now nearing one of these moments. And as you might imagine, there are many, many souls interested in active, activating every soul, every particle, every aspect within themselves and others to be enlivened and awakened for the experiences that are yet to come and unveil themselves in this moment. Ah, but there are also those with another calling, called to a conclave beyond the earth plane, called to explore and experience life beyond the physical, beyond the limitations. And so these begin to withdraw now. And as the moments continue to unfold, you will see that there is even more than at any other time an acceleration of the soul's directive an acceleration to move beyond the planes of the physical, even the accelerated planes of the physical, to move beyond these to the next available plane, where life, the eternal life of the soul, can be explored as well. It would be incorrect to think or to imagine that what you would term ascension or growth or discovery Transition, transformation, transmutation from one veil to the next or one age to the next must be accomplished in a physical body. Nothing could be further from the truth. And there are many, many souls that would prefer to throw their light in a lighter sense, to withdraw from the bodies in time. So for one reason or another, you will see this more and more. Matters not at what age, matters not young age, man or old age, woman. Matters the directive of the soul must be followed, will be obeyed. And in the great conclaves, both upon the earth and beyond the earth, in the great dimensional timescapes of all that is, comes the great discovery by which the soul's progress is marked. This time, this year, this particular juncture is, yes, a marker, a marker in the book of humanity, for humanity to say, I am, and I become more than I have been. I move beyond this veil and into the next place and into the next phase, and it is the soul's courtesy to acknowledge this, to favor this, and to assist humanity in its next endeavor. A soul is not a human. There are no human souls and other souls. There are no earth souls and other souls. There are simply souls, souls' essence, the essence of all that is, an expression of light and purpose is soul. It is a gathering of light and experience. It is the unfoldment of light. It is a harmonic expression of all that is. And so the light prepares to receive itself, to begin again, to reset itself. And so the life of the soul is set only to begin again, to revisit the next adventure the soul does not tire, it yearns. The soul does tire, yes, of being in a body or in a life. But a soul does not tire. It is made of an infinite light, the light of all that is. And all that is does not tire, not of humanity, not of this moment. And, sweet ones, neither desire until the next moment, by which I will bring to you an entirely different topic for your consideration and exploration. I bid you good day.